you, Stephanie. Thank you to Malaprops. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm from Hub City Press. We're located in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and we have been uh, around since 1995. That means 27 years, I think, if my math is right. Uh, we are a boutique independent publisher of fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and regional interest. Um, and we publish books by new and extraordinary Southerners about the American South. Hopefully at some point you've come across one of our books or come to an event that we've had at Malaprops. We consider Malaprops just uh, obviously one of the finest bookstores in the region. You're all so lucky to have it here in your community. Um, we also consider it part of our community at Hub City Press. And we're always so excited to have our authors come here. Um, to the very supportive Asheville community. Uh, we are in Spartanburg, we're in downtown. We have a bookshop as well, celebrating its 10th anniversary uh, tomorrow, actually. Um, and so we love independent bookstores and it's just uh, such an honor and thrill to be here with Brent um, to be able to do this conversation with him. Uh, not on a, well, we are on Zoom, I think, but also not on Zoom. Um, as I said to Brent last week, uh, this was the, I think the, the, the first book that we acquired fully in the pandemic, sort of like in the, when things had actually picked up and we were not uh, in our offices and, and everything was very different. So that makes it a particularly poignant thing to be launching into the world uh, two and a half year, two and a half year ish later. And that's not even covering the entire time that uh, Brent has been working on it. So um He's going to talk about that. Uh, we are going to talk for just a brief 25 minutes or so, and then we're going to leave lots of time for questions because I think this is a real, you know, not hometown crowd, but home home region crowd that probably has lots of questions for rent because you probably, uh, many of you have heard about this project and are aware of it and want to ask some questions. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to read your whole bio. It's, it's long and, and complex. <laughs> um, I would uh, prefer to, to ask you about your bio. Um, pretend that we haven't read your bio and uh, that I didn't just refuse to read it and tell us about how you uh, came to write this book, how you how you are in your career, both in nature and also in, in writing. Because I know you're an accomplished writer in many genres. So give us a little rundown. Um, bio starts back in Cobb County, Georgia with a love affair of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Probably, oh, forgot all about that. Um, and having a big map of the Great Smokies on the wall of my bedroom, just being a teenager and obsessed with the Smokies, thinking I got to get to the Smokies, and I never thought in a thousand years, probably at that point in my life as a teenager, that I'd be living, you know, in the foot of, like, south of the park, you know, as the crow flies five miles. So, very circuitous route, um, working in conservation for a career, uh, landed me here in 2003. Um, working for Land Trust, working for Main Spring Conservation Trust, which was then the Land Trust for Little Tennessee. Um, and Paul Bone still film on George Massa came out in 2003. And I saw the mystery of George Massa at the Franklin Library, downtown Franklin when it came out. And, uh, you know, it was just fascinated, of course, that was just another dimension to the park for me um, to think about. And of course, read our Southern Highlanders and, impossible to, to, to live over where I live without encountering Forrest Kepper um, in in day-to-day -day life and uh, literature. So um, that was my first introduction to Massa and working uh, later for the uh, Wilderness Society and just exploring the park my whole life, going on trails all over the park, bushwhacking down into the Three Forks area, plus my friend Earl Walker here. Uh, we've had quite a couple of uh, interesting adventures down in the Three Forks part of the Smokies. So uh, just a, you know, a love affair with the park, uh, more or less from my life. And then, um, you know, when the Kepper biography came out, when Janet, Janet McHugh and George Ellison, I did Back of Beyond, you know, that was probably one of the first real, I guess, a synthesis of what information there is on George Massa's life. So, um, you know, it was another avenue into Massa for me. And then just having John and Betsy, you have John Lane and Betsy Teeter, uh, and founders of Hub City. And uh, John was up in Howells doing a Zoner lecture, I think his book on How to Settle the South, maybe. I forget which book of John's it was that he was up in Howells doing a talk. And John and Betsy stayed at the house with us, and we had, uh, you know, some, some adult beverages. <laughs> and, uh, how all books this, are born. Yeah, that's how all books are born. And, uh, we started talking about this NASA project because the Kepler biography had come out and there was just a lot of interest in it. Uh, and so, you know, 
Betsy and John and I just talked about, well, how do we pull all the photographs together? They're all over the place. How do we put these into a book? Um, how do you want to write it? They kind of they gave me creative freedom to think about how to write the book. And, you know, for me, it was going to be a straight on kind of uh, get out and wander around in Massa's footsteps and just go back to all the places that Massa photographed and think about them 100 years later in a 21st century context. And as Meg said, of course, that was before the pandemic. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there we were in the middle of a book contract and lockdown and, you know, social distancing, and everything that went into the pandemic, everything that we lived, lived through and are currently living through. So the book became very much a book that was contextualized by the pandemic, uh, contextualized by the Black Lives Matter movement, which was also going on simultaneously. Uh, Asian massage parlor massacres, uh, all these things that were just kind of like apropos somehow to the life that Massa lived 100 years ago. When, you know, the Smokies in this region in the early 20th century, um, they were you know, going through amazing transitions, you know, of all sorts at that time as well. Nothing like those social issues, but definitely big, big issues of resource extraction. So, so I wandered around, you know, I wandered around the landscape and thought about Massa. Um. This, that, that is, you know, uh, very much how it came, came to be. I think people uh, sometimes have, uh, they think there's a lot of, you know, complex steps and sometimes it's just people coming together and talking about something and, and meeting somebody who's just so interested in something and knowledgeable about something and looking into something for so long, that excitement just kind of comes through, which I think it comes through very clearly in the book. Do you want to, um, uh, in case there's a, a single soul in here who doesn't know the story of George Massa, would you like to, to give a, a brief, quick overview of what we know and what we don't know? Uh, sure, um, I'm assuming everyone here knows something about George Massa. Um, and but we have a, a virtual viewers that can yes, be from everywhere. So, don't. so um, some of you might be aware that there was a new Massa historical marker installed right here in the town, uh, right across from where Massa's office was there near Packham Square, Plateau Studios. Um, most of, you know, half of Massa's life is still pretty much a mystery. So. Um, We've got 25 years, basically, of George Massa's life that took place before we ever set foot on American soil, to the best of our knowledge. So um, he was born either in 1881 or 1885 or 1890. <laughs> so, uh, those dates were used on various documents throughout his life. Uh, most of his friends said that when he died in 1933 here in Asheville, he was probably between the age of 45 and 50. Um, I, I, I basically exhausted George Ellison's book and William Hart's book and Paul Van Steele's book for biographical information. Uh, the only thing that I can say that I contributed to George Hill, uh, Massa's life as far as biographical information is that I found one of the first, one of the earliest records on George Massa um, in San Francisco in 1907. It was an advertisement in the San Francisco Chronicle for a first class butler named George Massa uh, who lived on Fillmore Street. Uh, I forget the exact number. My angel probably could tell you got numerology or something. Like that. Uh, you know, but uh, yeah, he, he came into this country uh, either in 1906 or 1907, and it still you know, was that our George Massa. You know, Paul and I, Paul Ben still not emailed back and forth. And Paul thought that was the first record that we have of Ben still in the country. And so let's assume that he worked as a butler in San Francisco. He said he could speak good English, kind, gentle soul. Um, and then he makes his way towards Asheville uh, in 1915 and uh, you know, travels some, somewhat like a vacation across the country, New Orleans, St. Louis, and different places. And ends up in Asheville and gets a job at the Grove Park Inn uh, as a bellhop and worked as a bellhop here for several years, again, getting into photography, snapping photographs of tourists. And Fred Lawrence Seeley, who was the manager of the Grove Park Inn, said, you know, he was a very talented guy, but he might have been a spy. <laughs> Turned in some information to the FBI on him, and you know, because Massa went back west for a while, didn't know if he was going to stay here. But he comes back and becomes this great photographer. Goes into business with Felton Studios here in Nashville, and then launches his own Plateau Studios. And for the 1920s, became like the the photographer for Asheville, Asheville Chamber of Commerce, New York Times, uh, rep for this area, um, on and on and on. Uh, Warner Brothers, um, Ripley's, believe it or not, um, and, you know, and then. Uh, of course, he was like the photographer for the smoking, you know, which was his passion, his hobby. That you was know, his hobby as much as his life. Um, yeah, he clearly wasn't making money as a photographer with the smoking. He was trying to protect the smoking, of course, kept 
and you know, which is something that can be just talked about a lot is the relationship between between NASA and Kepler. You know, what a fascinating, powerful, and dynamic relationship that was. Um, and then Kepler, of course, dies in 31. The depression, of course, it did in 1929. The NASA basically went broke. Uh, I mean, we could go on and on about this. I'll save some time for questions and answers and just shut up. But um, in 1933, he was basically uh, penniless and had TB. Had been out of, in and out of the hospital for a while and sick, and then of course uh, ends up in the hospital here in Nashville and dies basically destitute, and is buried in an unmarked grave out of Riverside Cemetery. So the Carolina Mountain Club uh, paid for his headstone. Uh, we can talk a lot more about Danny Bernstein this year. I saw her his relationship with the Carolina Mountain Club it was, it was a pretty profound uh, relationship. Uh, is that enough? <laughs> I think that's a good a good Too overview. Much, no, absolutely. Um, no, I think and I think it's important uh, to talk about what you do in the book. Um, you know, I, th I think there is a conversation to be had about why the sudden interest in the last little while about about his work and, and you know and why he disappeared um, from from sort of you know knowledge for so long. And and I think that um, you you do a, a great job pointing to you know how how there is definitely got to be racism at the root of it. Um, and you, you point to that very um, astutely and, and clearly. Um, and I, I, I wondered if you have, uh, you know, just wanted to speak on it a little bit, but why, why, why NASA right now or in the last, you know, 15 years? Why is the, what do you point to as the resurgence of, of well, um, Not I mean, just that he, des yeah. he deserves it and he yeah. should have been, that's obviously the, the, the right thing to say, but also, you know, other, uh, why it's happening. Um, I think Bonesteel's film was the beginning. And then George and Janet's um, uh, great biography, of course, Kepper, all the most recent and current information on NASA. And then William Hart, an essay, I think William Hart, he was at the City Lights reading the film. William Hart, great book on the Smokies, he walked every trail on the Smokies, wrote the first essay on NASA for, for a beautiful two volume collection called May We All Remember Well, which is about Western North Carolina history. Big, big, two, you know, highly collected. Full uh, two volumes set on NASA, and I think so. People have kept his legacy alive, um, but I would back up and say I don't know if his legacy would have survived without the Carolina Mountain Club uh, pushing for probably close to thirty years to get a peak name for NASA in the Great Smokies, and, and just a tremendous amount of resistance from the Park Service to get that to happen. And you can read Asheville Citizen Times articles for, for three decades of that effort. And how it took that long to get uh, NASA now uh, dedicated. And so I think that there has just been, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in him because he was one of the best photographers that this area ever produced. Uh, and I like to tell the story of Ansel Adams here in 1948, who came to the Smokies to photograph for National Geographic. And um, Ansel Adams they took the assignment and was here for I don't know how long, but. Uh, he, shot, he, he took the assignment for National Geographic and, and National Geographic. He told National Geographic, he said, I'll photograph these mountains, but it's going to be devilishly hard to get shots of these mountains. And so, uh, you know, it's to me a great tragedy that Ansel Adams was here and never saw George Massa photograph. And, you know, and then I can't remember if it was the Ken Burns documentary or where it was first mentioned, but maybe it was in Paul's film, but. Um, you know, Massa was called the Ansel Adams of the East. And I just thought, well, that's, no, it was like, you know, Ansel Adams was the George Massa of the American West. And like, you know, George Massa was taking incredible photographs uh, well, well over a decade before Ansel Adams had shot photographs. He got four usable photographs uh, Ansel Adams did out of the snow. That's not Amateur. <laughs> Total amateur. <laughs> <laughs> He never carried one of these in the three forks, I guarantee you. Um, well, I, I do want to touch on the fact that um, I think there are some very recognizable photos in the book, um, but uh, this is the problem when you get like the publisher here is like, I want to talk about the item as well. I think what you did very well is you assembled photos that also are not as iconic um, and also show the kind of documentarian side of his work, um, which is great for kind of witnessing the, the the change in the landscape and infrastructure and everything that was going on at the time. If he had been just solely taking pictures of vistas, they would be beautiful photos. And I think those are the ones that tend to get attached to media and everything. Um, 
But what I find interesting is looking through the kind of more like documentary day to day, like you just get the feeling that he's walking along. I mean, obviously this is not an iPhone, but um, like it takes a while to set up, but still like there's a kind of, there's almost a spur of the moment sort of humanity that comes through in a lot of these photos that maybe if you've only seen like really large Vista photos, um, I just encourage people to look through it because there are sort of smaller moment photos too, which I think are really compelling. Yeah, and, and that's, that's exactly it. Uh, everyone knows massive for his iconic big landscape photographs and the Smokies and the images that he took that were just so important for getting the park uh, protected. But, you know, he was hired by the town of Highlands in 1929 to create a promotional piece for the town of Highlands. And, you know, Highlands in 1929, they threw horseshoes on Main Street on July the 4th, you know, was the cook in, that's all there was. And, uh, you know, like, you know, Highlands was a tiny little mountain town where there were still loggers and farmers still living around the area and you know well before the days of going to, to buy a 750 dollars blazer at your boutique <laughs> store there you know so um and he took all these like people golfing at the highlands country club the first golf course in highland i counted 18 golf courses within five miles of highland when i wrote this book and so uh you know there he was in the colossasia gorge shooting photographs of blasting equipment Blasting out the Colossage Gorge Road, which if you've all have ever been up the Colossage Gorge Road in the Highlands, you know what a master of engine, masterpiece of engineering that is. Uh, and Massa just happened to be there of serendipitous that he was there. But those are photographs that Massa took of the Gorge Road being blasted out. You know? And so you travel the landscape with Massa, you see these other images, and you just really wonder what else he was thinking about this landscape at the time, which was going through so much, you know, all these rivers were being dammed, all these trees were being logged, old growth forest being cut, Smokies still up in the air, whether or not it would even be protected. Uh, Ravens Ford Lumber still having huge contracts to log the eastern half of the Smokies. Um, you know, the national forest system was still being established here. Weeks Act had only been passed since 1911. The first track of land ever protected for the national forest here around Asheville was the Vanderbilt Estate. Uh, 9,000 acres that uh, was sold to the Forest Service in 1916 for $3 an acre. Um, you know, so Massa was here to witness all this stuff, you know, and so you, you, you can't help but just wonder what what he was thinking as he shot all these other somewhat more diminutive photographs at time. He took photographs of people picking apples. There's just all kinds of stuff in a book that, you know, that I found scouring the archives out there. Every picture of the, in the book has a story. I could have probably worked my whole life trying to figure them out. And, and a lot of documents too, a yeah. lot of the handwritten things, which I think are really fascinating and add to again the kind of uh, portrait that you're 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 um, drawing in the in the book. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that so you you touched on the experience of writing this in the pandemic, and I think the pandemic does come. This this was so clearly written um, at a time where everything was was shut down. But the thing is, like nature wasn't, uh, you know, uh, in its own way, wasn't entirely shut down. Yeah, nature was working overtime. Yeah, nature was working overtime. Yeah. You had even more people in these parks than than you might have because it was considered a safe safe place. Um, so contrasting sort of that uh, the safety of nature or or you know um, escaping to nature in this particularly fraught moment during the pandemic, especially. Um, you have a little, you have a little scene page that you have read before. Is that about, um, is yeah. that one pandemic times? Oh yeah. Totally. Okay, well, you want, you want to read got, that a little bit? Um, got one on the Black Mountains and one on the Smokies that I picked maybe to read to give you some sense of what it was like to write this during pandemic. So, I think that's particularly- Any Black Mountain fans over <laughs> Smokies fans? <laughs> quick, right? quick vote. <laughs> oh, let's see. I read something about the Smokies last night. Let's do Black Mountain since that's closer to here. Um, so, you know, Ma Massa, Mount Mitchell State Park was not created until the 20s officially. Massa did an amazing promotional brochure for, um, for Mount Mitchell State Park. And uh, Mount Mitchell State Park at the time, you know, it's, it's developmental phase. It was going to be a working forest. It was going to be a state park. It's kind of up in the air where it was going to be. Um, so I dug into the history of Mount Mitchell you know, some. And there's a lot of that in this chapter, but uh, I'll say more about that maybe after after reading this little section. Um, but you know, I went up to Mount Mitchell during November of 2020, and you know, all the infrastructure shut down. There's access; you can park and go hike, go walk, but no bathroom, 
facilities or headquarters close down. Just kind of a brief kind of uh, give you a sample of what it was like to kind of move around in the world of George Massa during the pandemic. Right, before you get started, mm -hmm. I just want to pass along a request for you to hold the hold mic just, and just and just still because you yeah. forget about it and it's yeah. moving around. Yeah. And so we have someone who is coming in now. And I know it's annoying, but yeah. so just pass along. Yeah. It is. No, <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, Massa sits well dressed at the entrance to a tent cabin at Camp Alice. There's a photograph of Massa here sitting, you know, at Camp Alice. The end of the line for the Pearly and Crockett Railroad at the summit of Mount Mitchell. The year is 1924, and he's in his early 40s. He looks youthful, happy, and content unaware of how rapidly he will age and die early in the next decade. Mount Mitchell, the highest peak in the Black Mountains in Eastern North America, was on its way to becoming a state park. Named after botanist, geologist, professor, and Presbyterian minister Elijah Mitchell, his controversial legacy has lingered into the 21st century. Mitchell, a 19th century slave owner and avowed racist, was highly critical of Mount Peak whom he considered degenerate and under the negative influence of the untamed wilds of Western North Carolina. As a native of New England, Mitchell envisioned a similarly developed and pastoral future for the landscape. His lonely death in 1857 came from exploring the headwaters of the Cane River while trying to disprove the highly controversial claim that he was wrong in his altitude calculation of the blacks. This claim was launched by his former student, the North Carolina congressman and successful amateur geologist Thomas Klingman. Both men envisioned development for the area, though Klingman foresaw a more industrial model largely based on mining and extraction. While much more could be said about this controversy of these two ambitious individuals, the author is grateful that they both, in large part, came out losers in their dispute. So I'm going to jump over to a section where I arrived here, there's just a lot more kind of historical information. When I visit Mount Mitchell State Park in November 2020, it is open to visitors, but accepting the toilets, none of the facilities are open. At one in the afternoon, the car thermometer says 35 degrees, and the parking area that will easily hold a few hundred cars is empty, but for a dozen or so, almost all of them with out-of-state tags. Florida, South Carolina, Illinois, Indiana, Alabama, Georgia, Wisconsin, Virginia. The sky is cloudless, exceptionally clear, with an occasional stiff breeze. A few small groups of young people mill about the parking area, along with an assortment of couples, preparing either to leave or to hike. I climb the 300 yards from the closed visitor center to the summit in anticipation of what will be incredible views of the Black Mountains on this rare and clear autumn day. At the viewing platform, I am alone, but for a group of four young women who are cutting up and huddling against the cold. A few minutes later, a young couple arrives. Although we are all sharing a special place and a special moment, no one communicates or makes eye contact. It's like the pandemic has created communication distancing as well as social. The young white male in the couple is wearing a black hoodie that says, No Lives Matter. Behind the expression on the shirt is what appears to be a hockey mask from a horse. I have no idea what in the hell this means, but it doesn't feel right. I look at them, but they never look at me. I'm feeling pretty lonesome in this fair place and would love to chat, but they take selfies and head down the ramp to the actual physical summit. Elijah Mitchell's large stone grave lies upon the summit, and another group of young people is hanging out there, also taking selfies and laughing amongst themselves. They see the No Lives Matter guy and ask him to take a photo of him. I'm wondering what the sole African-American male in the group is thinking when the No Lives Matter guy stands before them. When I get home and do an internet search, I see that No Lives Matter is a song by the hip-hop group Body Count. It's about class and the fact that when it comes to poor people, no lives seem to matter. I feel better, but I'm also wondering if he knows much about Elijah Mitchell. <laughs> it's been only a few months since the Elijah Mitchell Audubon chapter for this area dropped his name because of his racist views, renaming itself the Blue Ridge Audubon chapter. The park was whites only for many years, a racist move made by the North Carolina legislature in the 1920s. Massa would have been here during that time, and I can't help wondering how he was able to pull it off. 
he had plenty of white friends and his photography was unparalleled and I'm sure that helped. <laughs> Sample kind of what, what it was like to roam around during the pandemic. <laughs> footsteps that were massive. Well, and I, I think you also do a great job talking about how some, uh, there's a lot of like development and sort of looking at the at the landscape now versus then. And you talk a lot about how things have developed so much, but then you also talk about how some of the places are harder to get to, which I think is a, a, a great takeaway from the book because it's not just like, oh, everything's more developed and there's more traffic and whatever else. It's like some of these places you had a devil of a time actually getting to maybe harder, harder than he had, or at least um, because some of it has been like rewilded at this point. So, um, so I, I think that's fascinating. You can, you can speak to that more. Maybe I just wanted to comment on it. Um, well, I want to, uh, I do want to open up for, for questions in just a few minutes, but I wanted you to maybe end our little conversation by saying, um, so you worked on this book for, for a long time, especially the research and the sort of assembling of it. And then also you, then you wrote it during these years during the pandemic. And, um, We've arrived here at a very different moment, a very different time, um, and uh, and a lot of new interests, revived interests, et cetera. So I guess um, you know how, how are you how are you feeling about George Massa today? Uh, how, how have you have you changed? Has your relationship with his work and him changed? What is the what is the thing that you've always wanted to get out to the world about him? And 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 you know have you have you accomplished it in the book? And do you want to? You want to do more <laughs> so this I, is your would, chance yeah i think so i would say more i would do more i would do more forever thank god for deadlines <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like uh you know and it was great to work with up city they're um, so patient during the pandemic and it was at times kind of tedious to get photographic rights and that type of thing but um you know i developed i suppose you can't help but develop somewhat of a personal relationship with someone even if they're dead we spend this much time with them and thinking about them and traveling their boats and feeling you know what might even be considered a presence at times so um yes i would say i have a lifelong relationship with george massa at this point <laughs> maybe a post-life relationship with george massa who knows uh but it was um you know i'll just say a little bit about where i think massa is going in history right now and that's a lot of it's due to other work that's being done on massa now uh, paul bone still and janet McHugh are now working on a biography on george massa as i said most of the information on massa's last 25 years of life are known fairly well here and fairly well exhausted i'm sure george and Jan paul and janet are discovering more on massa here in various places because it seems like stuff turns up all the time you know and kepard's photo lady kepard Horace Kepper's great niece found like a box of photographs in his attic and his aunt died of massive images that were unknown at the time. So, uh, you know, and so Paul and, and Janet are now doing a biography and they're actually using Japanese translators in Japan and researchers in Japan who can hopefully uncover more about what Massa's life as a young adult would have been before he entered this country at either 25 or 21 or 18 or whatever it was when he got here. You know? So um, I think he's going to finally get a more honorable place in Appalachian history. Um, and I can't, you know, the one thing that I could not help but feel as I researched this book and traveled around in Mass's footsteps that he had to, I'm sure that he experienced racism in the Southern Mountains. Uh, even though I'm, you know, friends of his, the Carolina Mountain Club, were his best friends and said that, you know, they always felt like Massa was very well respected and treated fairly among their colleagues and peers. But, you know, for example, Massa shot a Polaroid of Stone Mountain, Georgia, that we have no historical information on, but Stone Mountain was being proposed as the southern terminus of the Appalachian Trail at one point, as was Mount Oglethorpe, which it was the terminus for a while. Uh, and so there's photographs that Massa had of Stone Mountain, Georgia, um, from, from the 1920s. And you can literally see where the uh, Confederate memorial is being carved out of Stone Mountain from his photograph. And you know, he never got close to that. He helped but wonder if he knew better. And uh, so, you know, I feel like we're coming of an age where, you know, this is his, his time. It was great to see the new mass of historical markers come up in downtown Asheville. I know Ellie was there, and others probably in this room were there. 
So uh, we'll see what happens out of this, this biography. But uh, yeah. I want to answer that question adequately, but it's no, a hard did. question to answer. Good question. It's a great question. And it's a really hard question to answer. Well, I'm still dealing with yeah, and it's impossible to know if things are going to flip up for a second and then be, be you know, go go back or if it's going to be a steady climb to more recognition. So um, that's what we're, we're hopeful for. Um, we'd love to take some questions from the audience. Right in front of you. you guys do have masks on, so I'm happy to repeat questions if you need to. Uh, it seems to me that the fellow lines up in San Francisco from Japan, I guess we don't know what his criteria was for doing that. I'm just kind of curious because to line up in San Francisco and from out of the blue to decide that he needed to go to the mountains of Western North Carolina. Now this, for me, is, is quite a leap. Um, and, and do you know anything about that transition where there was a positive going through something or a negative going away from something? And for people watching virtually, this is a question about, do we have any information about why he left California? If that was a push, pushed out or, or a, a positive change? No, that's the simple answer. Um, he did come to Asheville via other cities. One can imagine that maybe he was looking for another place to land. Uh, for whatever reason, he ends up in Asheville. Uh, at one point, he considered going to study mining in Colorado. He actually wanted to study uh, photography at one point and had, uh, dabble even in woodworking and various activities like that. He returned to the West for a while, came back to Asheville to go back to work for Seeley at the Grove Park Inn. Um, and that's, who knows, and that's how he ended up being this great photographer. You know, it's, it's just a, that is a total mystery that he landed in San Francisco, let's say in 1906 or 1907. And you know, I asked that question in the book, could he possibly imagine that another, that in 15 years, 20 years, he was gonna be like the premier photographer for the Southern Appalachians, for this landscape, you know, for, for the Asheville Chamber of Commerce. But that in itself is just an incredible story. I mean, he was here during you know, some of the earliest anti-immigration Asian and anti-immigration acts were passed in the early 20th century up through the teens. Uh, you know, he was you know, a landscape known for its fear of outsiders. Uh, so, yeah, it's that's a really good question. And I hope that Paul and Janet can find an answer to that. <laughs> I'd love to see the answer to that myself. I mean, the, the one I do say throughout this book, or it's implied, you know, the mystery of George Massa that continues to live on. Um, I'm Danny, and I'm with Carolina Mountain Club, and we are celebrating our 100th anniversary next year, and I'm writing the history. So obviously, Massa is part of it, um, and he was well integrated in CMC. He was chair of the hiking committee, and he wrote hike reports just like everybody else, and um, took people hiking. So. Um, he was kind of quote an everyday Joe yeah. in uh, in Asheville. Yeah, yeah, and um, I have some of those reports are actually reproduced in the book. Great, because I, I I found his Carolina Mountain Club reports just wonderful images of themselves, and you know, Hub City was so open, just like didn't have any massive photographs. Let's use massive correspondence. There, there's a receipt. <laughs> there's a photograph of a receipt in this book where the Carolina Mountain Club is riding to the funeral home to cover his burial expenses. So I took, took full liberty, Hub City allowed me to do that, to just choose whatever images I thought you know, were apropos to, to the writer. Um, you know, and those, like Herman would love my friend Herman here, who we almost died one time, it felt like we could have been at three quarts. Um, you know, uh, his, his trip reports, Reproduced one of those are reproduced in the book, a trip report he took down to three forks. Um, you know, and he just to give you an example of what of what he you know he was like, you know, he and Kepper and Ted Alexander primarily went to three forks often. 
And it was a little easier to get into maybe then, a little more established trail than the three forks, but you know, Massa would lug a camera like this into those areas and a tripod from those areas um, and a bedroll and be fine sleeping under a bluff for the night with a few tins of caviar. You know, and he was doing those trips with the most consummate woodsman in America, Horace Kepper, who had written uh, Camping and Woodcraft in 1913, which became like the definitive guide to outdoor camping and woodcraft. And so, you know, there's Horace Kepper with Massa traveling into Three Forks with all this cooked gear and shotguns, and fishing rods, and, you know, little George Massa barely weighed 100 pounds wet, 5'1", to this thing around. So, uh, you know, um, and I read one of his trip reports to Carolina Mountain Club where he led a group into Three Forks. Uh, and first night, they hiked all the way into Three Forks. It was over nine miles from, uh, I think they hiked in Menlo Creek exactly where it was they started. They got into Three Forks after nine miles of walking up into Three Forks. The next day, George Massa takes off. This is a Carolina Mountain Club trip. He and another group of hikers go 16 miles round trip up the headwaters of Three Forks to Mount Vigo and back to Three Forks camp the same day. And then he hikes out the next morning with the group. And, you know, I'd be dead. <laughs> just uh, you know, so he was just renowned for his ability to get out of covered ground with a camera. Well, it's also I think it's also fascinating, kind of the, the different ways to be an outdoorsman in terms of like envisioning yourself as one and 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 telling other people how to do it and involving all of this gear and all of this you know uh, the trappings of it sort of. And then there's this this other form which is just going out and and laying on a bedroll and and doing and also you know accomplishing this uh, this artistic endeavor at the same time completely completely different relationship like probably with with the natural yes, world yes totally um and yeah. it's a lot less ownership of it i think a lot less in, yes. entitlement to it yeah. in in a lot of ways um about being in it and and witnessing it uh instead of trying to tame it or you know submit or whatever um so i think yeah it's that maybe that was a um, that, maybe that was great for them to see. <laughs> different well, I mean, I mean, that, that's, I mean, that raises a good point about you know something else to be learned from all this. For me, anyway, um, you know, traveling under the pandemic in an outdoor store in our town, Franklin Outdoor Seventy Six, it was like a zoo. You know, whole town. Angela and I were running a, a ecotourism business during the pandemic, and you know, you're working seven days a week. People coming from all over to get on the Old Tennessee River for the day, or go hiking, or birding, or whatever. And, you know, they're spending a fortune on outdoor lightweight gear and you're looking at all this super expensive, you know, my new two pound tent and, you know, my whatever, my backcountry espresso maker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and you think about George Massa, you know, wandering around these mountains a hundred years ago, just like John Muir really is kind of like living off the most basic of, of essentials and, uh, so it was just such a contrast to think about nature now and nature then, uh, and how we all just kind of become gearheads. You know, I'm a one off too. <laughs> yes, we have a question from the at home okay. audience, um, and it's someone who's asking. And you you mentioned a little of this, but someone who's asking you to talk a, a bit more about the types of archival sources. And how you locate. Sure. Um, the biggest collection of massive images is at the Great Smoky Mountains Association, which I just knew from I don't know, just from various years of looking at massive stuff or whatever, seeing his images in magazines and GSMA always kind of being in the reference for those. Um, so it was acquiring uh, rights. From GSMA, they had over 300 massive images, and some of those have been from Liddy Kepper in recent years, founding that you know, collection that was unknown. Um, and then Western Carolina University uh, has a really good archival collection of massive journal entries, masses, uh, maps, correspondence uh, with Kepper and many others. Um, and so, you know, and Western Carolina University is right there near where I live, not far. So. It was just great to be able to go to Western, sit down, Jason Brady just bought everything that I wanted to see for the day. And he was extremely helpful. It was during the pandemic, I'd be the only person in there, you know, working on stuff like that. And, uh, and then uh, Pack Memorial Library here in 
Nashville has a pretty good collection of massive postcards. They have some Carolina Mountain Club material. Um, that was great, but also Chimney Rock photographs were here as well. Uh, so that was a real, I just, you know, going to Chimney Rock State Park and after seeing all these massive images, and those are in the books. A lot of those are in the book too. Uh, and also University of North Carolina, Asheville, where Carolina Mountain Clubs, most of their materials were at UNC Asheville. And uh, Gene Hyde, if you want to know Gene, is extremely helpful uh, with that collection. And Massa's images were not even uh, available online. And so, um, or his, um, all the trip reports, correspondence, and everything that's at UNC Asheville. This was a pandemic, and I guess Gene had some time on his hands and he had interns. And they ditched us, the whole election, or most of it, just because I was doing this. You know? So that was a really another kind of thing that came out that will help people in the future maybe you know, do their own research on this or work on it. That's truly the best part about books is that they do sometimes cause collections to sort of look at what they have. And sometimes they have two boxes full of stuff and archives and things like that. So um, that's one immediate impact that the book has already had. <laughs> I'm sure many more to come. Any other questions in, in the room? Any more online that we need to? Oh, okay. Yeah, the uh, I've read read uh, your work here, but uh, was he writing for like a uh, just for identification uh, specifics, or did he actually get uh, a perspective, like his own personal perspective, uh, in his writing? And so that you could actually say that uh, how he felt about the I don't know, see the. Uh, in front of the mountain or, or anything like that for the first time or you know that kind of expression of where he was because he obviously enjoyed it a great deal to spend his life doing it and to have him reflect that in his writing I, I, I guess is what my question is because I plan to <coughs> see what you have there yeah. uh, but I would say that I mean his art of course is an expression of what the world as far as an artist those images speak for themselves about how he viewed nature how he experienced nature i think some of the more revealing things about him were things that he said to people like Lola love who was a, a uh, reporter at the Asheville citizen times in the 1920s or writing this is when he kept up with good friends with Margaret gooch and um, some of those letters you know, reveal some of his kind of thinking about the place uh, and one that really sticks out is an interview that Lola Love um, talks about um, where Massa, you know, it was, this was in 19, like 1930 or around the time that Kepler died in 31 and Massa you know, really struggling just as, as a business owner and an artist trying to make it here. Uh, you know, he would just say, um, everything may be really bad right now and my business is failing, but I'm just going to go to the Smokies for about a week <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know when i get back i'll be all right and that's kind of what he did i think you know and and he had a there was a map in uh, massa's office here in nashville where uh, he just kept pinpoints of where all he had been in the park people who would go in his office to see that map would just be blown away because massa had been everywhere in the spring. He and Kepper mapped the Appalachian Trail out in the Smokies with other members of the Carolina Mountain Club. And, uh, he and Kepper both served on the nomenclature committee for the park. So they both were exploring the park together and, and submitting place names to the park. So uh, he absolutely had uh, an intimacy with the landscape that I think you can find hard. It'd be hard to find anyone. You know, there were, of course, people that are here riding in this landscape at that time. But, uh, I think everyone in Massa said that he had an incredible um, aesthetic sense of, of what was in front of him, wherever he was. I think. Think. Excuse the practicality, but did he have a car? Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. It bothered me. I never actually found. Yeah. I mean, did. that's kind of a tragic, another tragic story from the uh, from his bad years following the depression. Uh, is that he did have a car and it was stolen uh, in the late 1920s. I want to say it might have been 29. Um, and it was just totally trashed out, unrecoverable. And it 
was found, but it just someone had just stolen it from him, abandoned it somewhere. And, uh, he never got another vehicle after that. Uh, but he and Kemper traveled some roads together, some, did some driving. In the, I mean, some story in Smokies about how they traveled. They went from Gatlinburg over to Cherokee at the time. And that was a single lane gravel road between Gatlinburg and Cherokee. And they got stuck and had to walk to a champion fiber lumber camp to uh, get pulled out. You know, I've got a shot in the book of the newfound gap that he took in the 1920s where it was just a gravel pull off on the side of the road. And, you know, and now it's probably one of the most visited spots in any national park in North America. Well, um, oh, oh, we got a last question in the back. Um, so he's interred in Riverside. Yes. He never made it to the Smoky Mountain. No, no, and that was his dream was to be buried next to he wanted to be buried next to Horace Kepper. Um, it was really interesting last night. I did a reading at uh, talk at Cowie School. Uh, in Macon County, um, and a woman who, you know, just it's been really into Massa for a long time. I corresponded with her about Massa. She, when she found out about the book, she was writing me about Massa. Uh, and she's a person of means. Um, and last night uh, at the end of the talk, um, she said, I want to revive that idea of moving Massa to Bryson City, and I want to help pay for it. <laughs> so, but I'm mean, um, CMC's probably got a lot of ownership about him staying right in the river right now. So, yeah. 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 Anyway, it was, a, it was a really special project. Thanks, Meg, for, for making it happen. Well, thank you, Brent, for putting it together and for uh, taking so much care with it. I think that anybody who spends time in these pages is going to see how much care and effort and thought Brent put into the into this project. Um, and we hope that um, you will pick a copy up from Malibrox, Um and also uh, maybe one for a friend, an, another similar uh, mountain-geared friend. Uh, tell people about it, um, and uh, just uh, thank you all for coming so much uh, to this amazing night, and got to hear from Brent, got to hear about the book, and asking questions, and uh, it's just always such a wonderful thing to have a book event at Malaprops. We just Absolutely. love love this community so much and this community has been so supportive of Brent's book so far and we're just immensely grateful so um thank you all for coming and please buy a book and have it signed by Brent thank you so much